Grace be to you and peace from God our Father, from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. The word of God for our devotion this evening is Luke chapter 22. We read there verses 31 and 32. Simon, Simon, Satan has asked to sift you as wheat, but I have prayed for you, Simon, that your faith may not fail. And when you have turned back, strengthen your brothers. This is God's word. In the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, dear friends. Would Satan be able to seduce Peter and the other apostles away from their faith in Christ as he had done Judas? Satan is, after all, the church's adversary. Jesus addressed Simon by his old name, you noticed. It wasn't by accident. Jesus wanted to remind the apostle of his own frailty. Simon was not alone, however, in danger. The warning that Jesus sounds, mentioning Simon's name twice for emphasis, Simon, Simon, Satan has asked to sift you as wheat. The you pronoun there is plural. Jesus wasn't just talking about Simon. He was warning all the apostles that Satan was going to try to lead them away from their faith in him. Satan wanted very much to trouble the apostles, to trouble the church. Satan perhaps thought that he would be able to expose all the apostles of Jesus as chaff rather than wheat that is separated at the time of the harvest. But whether Satan just wanted to trouble them or whether he really thought that he could turn them all into Judas, we really would never know. But we do know that Jesus was well aware of Satan's intent for his church. And so he sounds this warning. Jesus knew that Satan would never give up troubling the church, troubling you and me. Our adversary, the devil, seeks to sift us as wheat also. The gleaners in Jesus' day would sift wheat, would separate the wheat from the chaff to cleanse it. But Satan wants to sift us as wheat in order to destroy our faith in Jesus as the Christ, as our only Savior from sin. Satan wants to destroy our faith in God's word and thereby turn away from the thing that preserves our faith. We have the third petition in the prayer that Jesus taught us as our prayer against those attacks. What is the will of God? That we keep his name holy? That we let his kingdom come among us? How are we able to do that? Only when we are strengthened by the word and when we are strengthened in our faith. In Luther's explanation of the third petition, the doctor reminds us then that to keep God's name holy, to let his kingdom come, we need God to break and to destroy our enemies that want to prevent us from doing those things. 
that want to prevent us from following God's word and want to destroy our faith. And those three enemies are the devil, the unbelieving world, and our own sinful flesh. Jesus' intervention as our Savior was not only for the church, but it was also for Simon himself. Jesus knew how impetuous this apostle was. Jesus knew that his pride and his self-reliance was going to lead him into sin. And so he didn't just say that Satan wants to sift all of you believers as wheat. But in the second part, Jesus says, with a singular you and very personal, but I have prayed for you, Simon, that your faith will not fail. Jesus addressed Simon, certainly well within the hearing of the other disciples. Jesus, our high priest, interceded for the entire church and then also prayed and interceded and intervened on behalf of Peter as an individual. He realized that Peter needed it the most because of that impetuous nature, because of that pride, self-reliance, self-sufficiency, that boldness that made Peter say right after this, though all others will forsake you, I never will. I am willing not only to go to prison for you, but to die for you. Jesus wanted to make Peter aware of that pride, aware of that sin, of that pride. He wanted Peter to have some humility. It is with that awareness and that acknowledgement of our pride, of our natural self-sufficiency and self-reliance, that we pray the third petition. Without humility, without the realization of our total helplessness to remain in the faith, to, to guard our faith apart from God's word, we will be destroyed. And so we regularly pray, Our Father in heaven, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Empower us to keep your name holy, to let your kingdom come among us. Give us the strength by the power of your word to continue to believe in you, to trust in you until the end of our lives on this earth. Father, we call on you to break and to destroy every evil plan and purpose of those evil three, Satan, the unbelieving world in which we live, and our own sinful nature that we still drag around and try to, tries to reassert itself in our lives. If God does not keep us strong, Satan can lead us away from God's word. And then we fall into error. We fall into unbelief and other great shame and vice. If God doesn't answer our prayer and deliver us and protect us from the people and the things of this sinful world around us, they are going to hinder us and prevent us from doing God's will, from keeping his name holy from sharing the word and believing the word ourselves. They could lead us to ignore, forget, or deny Jesus in our lives. And our sinful flesh wants to daily rise up and again promote its hatred 
of God's word. It's apathy toward things spiritual. It's desire to reinstate itself to be proud and reliant upon self rather than to trust in Jesus. It is only God through his word that he will preserve us in our faith. And so in the third petition, we pray, God, through your word, protect my faith. Keep me in my faith all my life. God, make me like those holy ones in heaven who, as the psalmist says in Psalm 103, verse 2, who are mighty ones who do your bidding, who do his bidding, who obey his word. We cannot take care of God's word without God's power. We can't stay in the faith without the power of God's word. We can't lead a godly life of sanctification apart from God's word. It was God's grace alone through the word of forgiveness that had worked faith in Peter's heart that kept Peter in the faith even as Peter denied his Lord around the fire in the courtyard of the high priest. Jesus did not pray that Simon would be excused from the temptations to deny him. But he said, Simon, I prayed for you that your faith does not fail. Jesus intervened on Peter's behalf and the Heavenly Father heard that prayer and answered that prayer. When you read the scriptures around this, you notice that Peter went back to his name Peter even as he was denying Christ. Because Peter, even though he was denying Jesus with his mouth, Satan was not able to quench the fire of his faith in Jesus that was in Peter's heart. It was the Holy Spirit that enabled Peter to go out and to weep bitterly in godly sorrow. We call it godly sorrow because it's sorrow worked by God. It's true repentance, contrition, acknowledgement that I have sinned against the Lord. But then a trust, a belief that I have forgiveness for that sin in Jesus. And by the power of that gospel, the Spirit kept Peter in faith and keeps you and me in faith, even when we foolishly deny Jesus with our mouths and with our actions. Satan cannot destroy the faith that is in our hearts. St. Paul wrote in a oft-quoted passage in 1 Corinthians 10, 13, no temptation has seized you except that is common to man, and God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, he will also provide a way out so that you will stand up under it. And that way is his word. That way to stand up and keep our faith is to use the word. And we are not tempted beyond what we can bear because our high priest intercedes for us that our faith does not fail. And the Father hears that prayer that we pray in the third petition. Satan often attacked Jesus, and all for naught, because Jesus is the sinless one. But Satan knows, however, that he may still attack the members of Christ's church. Because even though we are believers, we are not sinless ones. 
we remain sinful. Satan reminds us of our sins, doesn't he? He reminds us that the wages of our sin is death, that we deserve to be eternally separated from God in hell. If he couldn't get the head, Satan was frantic to try to destroy the church, to attack the body, to rain body blows down on the spiritual body of Christ. We know that he sifted them all as wheat and not just Peter. Sometimes what is forgotten because of Peter's denial is in the Garden of Gethsemane, even before Peter denied Jesus, all of the disciples fled. All the disciples forsook Jesus in their fear about what might happen to them. Even before Jesus fulfilled his redemption of the world, Satan tried to destroy the church. But even then, he couldn't do it without control by God. He couldn't do it according to his will. He couldn't tempt them without God's permission, without the boundaries that God set on him. Think also of Job and the different steps of the temptation that Job had to go through. God does not let us be tempted by Satan so that Satan can drive us to the brink and then Jesus can see if we're going to go over the edge or not. God lets us be tempted so that you and I can use his word that he has given us by which he defeated the devil, by which we now defeat the devil. He lets us be tempted so you and I can pray, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Strengthen me by guarding your word in my life. Guard and strengthen my faith in you so that I can keep your name holy, so that I can let your kingdom come, so that Satan and the unbelieving world and my own sinful flesh will not destroy me. Break their plans. Destroy their purposes. Because you have died on the cross and have promised us that you will do that. St. Peter, a man who had experienced great sin, but who had experienced great forgiveness when Jesus looked at him in love. Peter, I still love you, even though you did this. Writes these words about God's guarding our faith. You, through faith, are shielded by God's power until the coming of the salvation that is ready to be revealed at the last time. Almost always at the end of a sermon, our pastors speak what's called the votum or the peace. And it's a reminder that that gospel that we just shared with you and ourselves that gives us that peace of God in Christ, what is that peace going to do? Well, we use the words of Paul to the Philippians. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Jesus knew that Satan would not crush his friend's heart. Jesus calls him Peter, even as he describes Peter's denial. Jesus knew that the Holy Spirit would work repentance in the apostle. And that's why Jesus went on to tell him, and when you have turned back, and that's the same word that we use for conversion, so Jesus said, Peter, you're going to deny me. But after you've repented, after you've acknowledged your sin and trusted me for forgiveness, then strengthen your brothers. 
He had lived it himself. He had denied his Savior, but had experienced that great joy of forgiveness. So he could go to them and say, you know, you ran away, but Jesus forgives you. Jesus still loves you. And that would strengthen them because that's the gospel. That's the word that would strengthen their hearts. In the third petition of the Lord's Prayer, we pray for God's protection and deliverance from the schemes and threats of the devil, the world, and our flesh that would hinder and prevent God's will among us, that we keep his name holy, and that we let his kingdom come. God's will is that we teach his word in its purity. His will is that all people believe his word. His will is that all people who believe his word live a godly life according to it. And so we pray that God alone, who has the power, would break and defeat the plans of those unholy three. How urgent it is then that we are in the word. How urgent it is that we rely on the power of God's word. How urgent it is that we continue to trust that the forgiveness that we have in the cross of Jesus Christ reassures us that we are still his disciples even when we fail. How urgent it is for us to pray often, our Father in heaven, let your saving plan be done rather than the plans of the unholy three. Amen.